In this video, we're going to explore the applications of natural language processing in finance. Just a quick recap though, recall that we said NLP is just a set of techniques which helps us gain insights from text data. Further recall that while the applications of NLP in finance are quite wide in their scope, we can broadly categorize them into three different types including context, compliance, and quantitative analysis. What we're gonna do now is to explore the applications of NLP and finance within each of these three different types or categories. Starting with context then, so applications of NLP in context include, for instance, exploring what type of text moves the market, what sort of text causes the prices of stocks uh, to increase or decrease. Back in 2004, Antoine and Frank explored whether or not the messages on internet investment forums actually matter, right? So you've probably come across these forums. If you haven't come across them personally, you might well have heard of these forums where usually you have a lot of people just participating in these forums, many claiming to be gurus or the sort of gods of finance, if you like, the ones who claim to know, um, you know how to predict stocks uh, or predict the movement of the market and so on and so forth. And so Antweiler and Frank looked to study whether those messages actually mattered, right? So when people say, you know, XYZ stock is gonna increase tomorrow and, you know, if you've got enough people saying that, does that actually cause the price of uh, XYZ PLC to increase, for instance? And what they found, arguably unsurprisingly, uh, is that, of course, the messages on the forums don't quite matter, right? So they don't have any sort of impact as far as the returns of securities go. What is interesting, however, is that they found some evidence to show that the internet investment forums do have some sort of an effect on volatility, right? So the risk of securities. And so the takeaway there was that internet forums don't really have an impact on the price or returns of securities, but they can have some sort of an effect on the volatility or risk of securities. So they can, in fact, increase the volatility of securities. Other studies have looked at the impact of news on uh, securities. So good news versus bad news or macroeconomic news versus firm level microeconomic news and so on and so forth. But what they ultimately try to do is to evaluate what sort of text has an impact on either securities individually or collectively or indeed at a macro level. The other area of context includes extracting themes or topics from news articles. So this is a relatively recent study where Bibi et al. in 2019, they took about 800,000 articles from the Wall Street Journal and applied topic modeling or unsupervised machine learning algorithms to try and deduce themes or topics from within those news articles. And as a result, they went from, you know, 800,000 news articles where it's difficult to kind of figure out what's going on to about 180 unique themes or topics. And thanks to that, we can kind of get a feel for what the news articles are talking about or discussing um, every single month. So in this case, it's really about bringing some sort of method into the madness or order into the chaos. Moving on. The other application of context includes classifying firms into relevant industries dynamically. So traditionally, firms are usually classified into one industry, you know, and they sort of remain in that industry indefinitely, right? So permanently. And this approach has existed for, you know, about a century, if not longer. The problem, of course, is that the pace of change and the pace of development is significantly faster now than it was, say, 100 years ago. And we've sort of moved away from the times where firms operated in the same single industry. Right. So today, firms operate in multiple industries. So if you think about a firm like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, then you would think that they operate in the beverages industry. But actually, they oftentimes also have food products like crisps or, you know, other unhealthy snacks. And so they're not just in the drinks or beverages industry. They're also in the food industry. Now, of course, you could argue that they are just in the food and beverage industry. They're not in some sort of automobile industry. And, you know, you'd be right. But if you now think about a firm like, say, Apple or Google, then, of course, they operate in the tech industry, but they also operate in hardware, right? So they create these phones or, you know, computers and MacBooks and notebooks and laptops and, and you know, Apple stores and Google Play stores. And I could go on. <laughs> but the point is that, you know, it's not one single industry. And arguably, more importantly, the industries can change over time. And so what Hoberg and Phillips did was to look at the business descriptions of firms and they used that text to try and classify firms 
into industries more dynamically, right? So the idea is that firms are talking about their industries in their business descriptions or annual reports, which of course are available every year. And so if you were to look at the text inside those annual reports or business descriptions for that matter, um, over a period of time, then you can get a sort of time varying uh, industry classification. And of course, this is only really possible because we're now able to analyze these vast volumes of text um, programmatically. And again, thanks to that, it's not limited to just, um, you know, classification of industries, we can also look at measuring technological innovation, right? So we can see, for instance, whether or not firms patents are value relevant, for instance, do they actually increase the value of the firm? And you know, if we're trying to measure technological innovation, we don't have to just restrict ourselves to looking at the amount firms are spending on R&D, we can dig deeper and get a much richer um, measure of technological innovation. All right, hopefully that gives you some sort of inclination as to the applications of NLP in finance for context. Do bear in mind, of course, that we're just about scratching the surface here. And there are, of course, several other applications of NLP uh, in finance for context. But let's move on for now, though, and look at the applications for compliance. So applications in compliance at least today, appear to be more prevalent in the real world or you know, in the practitioner world. So there's not a lot of academic research that's gone into this you know, relative to the amount that's gone into context. Of course, there's always research in compliance as well, but the ones we found interesting particularly are of course um, detecting and preventing insider trading as well as reducing fraud and internal threats and of course meeting regulatory requirements. In fact, this last part is also looking at applying natural language generation and not just natural language processing. So in natural language generation, for instance, this is things like generating text programmatically or using artificial intelligence. You might well have heard of instances where the artificial intelligence is creating news articles or you know writing out stories. And so we're probably not too far away from artificial intelligence or AI uh, writing out annual reports or you know other regulatory text documents um, automatically. But for the most part, at least today, the applications for compliance are on detecting and preventing insider trading or you know breaches of compliance, including fraud and internal threats. And I'd encourage you to take a look at this regtech firm Behavox, which is doing some pretty interesting things by applying NLP in finance for compliance. All right, last but certainly not the least, let's look at the applications in quantitative analysis. Well, these have included identifying and then hedging or reducing risks, including economic shocks, uncertainty, as well as climate change. And while all of these are looking at different types of risks and you know reducing these different types of risks, they're all united in their approach of working with text data and of using some state-of-the-art NLP techniques to identify and quantify these risks. For the most part, when people are looking to quantify these macro level risks using text data, they tend to work with news articles as the source of the text data. And of course, that's intuitive, right? Because the news is likely your best source of what's going on in the world. It's not the only source by any means, but it's certainly one of the more rich and diverse sources of text that are out there. Apart from looking at news articles and estimating macro level risks, people have also looked at measuring things like the readability and indeed usefulness of disclosure, right? So firms all around the world spend so much time, effort and money and indeed other resources to create these reports, right? Be they annual reports or quarterly reports or corporate social responsibility reports or CSR reports. There's so much information that firms publish, but is it actually useful? In the previous video, for instance, we saw that the average annual report, at least in 2013, had about 42,000 words, right? And that number is not getting any smaller. So it is interesting to at least explore whether all of this blob of text is actually meaningful. And it turns out actually it is, because what the research has found is that firms that disclose more, so firms that provide more information or are more transparent with their information or the volume of information that they disclose, well, those firms tend to perform better. Right, so investors naturally like firms that disclose more or are more transparent, but it turns out that those firms also tend to be more profitable compared to firms that disclose less. And so this is just another example of how, thanks to NLP, we're able to firstly measure something like readability and then link it to something like profitability to analyze whether firms that disclose more 
or you know have more readable financial statements are more profitable vis-a-vis -vis those firms that disclose less or have you know less readable financial statements or annual reports but it doesn't just stop at that because we can actually create trading strategies using sentiment, for instance, right? So the researchers found that sentiment can matter. So things like the tone in which firms communicate in their annual reports, as well as in their conference calls. So whether they're communicating more positively or more negatively, or, you know, with greater uncertainty and so on and so forth. So the idea with sentiment-based trading strategies is firstly, of course, to measure the sentiment and you know we'll define sentiment later on but basically we're trying to measure this thing that we call sentiment or emotion if you like so positivity or negativity and so on and so forth and then we're using those measures of sentiment to create trading strategies and of course this is something that we're actually going to do in this course together but it's important that you know that the techniques that you'll be learning to apply in this course um, have actually been used in cutting edge research and this is not some sort of mumbo jumbo uh, or in fact, you know, guesswork, for instance. But as far as this video goes, hopefully you've had a fairly good insight into the applications of NLP in finance for context, compliance, and quantitative analysis. Importantly, the applications of NLP in finance are still relatively new, and we are really only just getting started. And so I'm particularly pleased that you're joining me on this journey of working with text data in finance and of using NLP in finance because it is in fact a fascinating new world or a new realm within finance. It allows us to explore some fascinating questions, including for instance, whether positive firms outperform negative firms or whether firms with less uncertainty are less risky than firms with more uncertainty. And of course, there's always two parts to these questions, right? So there's the implicit or subtle part, which is, well, firstly, how do you define a positive firm or a negative firm, you know, or a less uncertain or more uncertain firm? And then, of course, there's the empirical finance question or the investment analysis question, which is, you know, do these firms outperform the other ones, right? So do positive firms outperform negative ones? Do firms with less uncertainty outperform those with more uncertainty? Do firms' corporate social responsibility policies matter? And, you know, can we create some sort of a trading strategy uh, based on firms' corporate social responsibility policies? Or, you know, even more broadly, do narcissistic CEOs outperform their modest counterpart? We're not going to be able to answer all of these questions in this course, or even in several courses for that matter, because the questions are, of course, quite diverse, and, you know, they can require working with completely different sets of data. The whole purpose of me showing you these questions is to sort of open up your mind so that you see that there is this whole other world to explore. And the reason this is particularly important is because as diverse as all of these questions are, the methodologies we use in exploring and answering these questions rigorously are in fact quite similar and indeed quite standardized. In other words, the overarching approach and the principles are fairly consistent, even though the questions being posed are significantly different. And what this means is that the skills that you'll gain in this course are significantly transferable. And this, of course, means that you'll be incredibly empowered to explore a multitude of NLP applications in finance, not just the specific ones we're going to cover in this course. And again, the reason I'm stressing this so much is because I'm hoping that you'll join me in working with text data and finance and that you'll join me in pushing the boundaries of finance further to explore unanswered questions in interesting and intriguing ways. All right, hopefully that's inspired you to keep an open mind throughout the course and look out for ways to apply the skills that you're gonna gain in other settings to explore other questions. Before we close off though, I wanna draw your attention to an implicit and really important assumption of using NLP for investment analysis, right? So the implicit assumption of using NLP techniques for investment analysis is that the returns of securities or the risk of securities or you know the profitability of firms are a function of more than just the numbers right so generally speaking or at least traditionally when we thought about investment analysis we've only really looked at the numbers you might look at things like firms profitability and you know you can go into the gross profitability or the operating profitability or the net profit or you know cash flows and what have you not as different as all those metrics are they are, of course, numbers, right? And so for the most part, 
Traditionally, at least, we've worked with numbers, but by using NLP for investment analysis, we're saying that you know the story is a lot bigger than that. It's not just about the numbers, it's about more than just profitability or operating performance and future cash flows of firms. And indeed, it's even more than just the market risk premiums or size and value premiums or momentum or indeed other asset pricing factors. Essentially, we're saying there's something like a gold mine out there, but instead of gold, it's text. And instead of mining for gold, we're mining for text because we're saying that there's some sort of value in that text. And it's a case of using these NLP techniques to firstly derive these insights and then to deliver value by using these insights, by using that text for investment analysis. All right, in summary, we reinforce the fact that broadly, NLP is applied in finance for context, compliance, and quantitative analysis. We learned that sentiment analysis, which is something we're gonna cover in more detail in the next video, forms a large and important part of NLP-based investment analysis, right? So it's about quantifying the sentiment and then using it for investment analysis. Last but certainly not the least, we learned that the implicit assumption of using NLP techniques for investment analysis is that the returns of securities are a function of more than just the numbers. In other words, they're also a function of information that's presented in text, and it's a case of mining that text, deriving insights, and using that for investment analysis. Now, we've included the references to all of the articles that we mentioned in this particular video, so if you are interested in any of that research, or in fact, if you're interested in diving deeper into the applications of NLP for finance, feel free to give these a read. That's enough for me for now, though. Have a go at the quiz, and I'll see you in the next video.